Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Net Zero Nuclear Pavilion in the Blue Zone of COP28. I am, my name is Jennifer Gordon, and I'm the director of the Atlantic Council's Nuclear Energy Policy Initiative. And I am so delighted to be moderating this discussion on one of my favorite topics, which is novel approaches to engaging nuclear newcomers. And I think what's so fascinating about this subject is the broadness of the definition of what it means to be a nuclear nuclear newcomer. So we'll be talking about new countries, new audiences, new businesses, um, all kinds of things. And I am so, so delighted to introduce this group of incredibly esteemed panelists. First, the Honorable Bonnie Jenkins, who is Under Secretary of Arms Control and International Security at the United States Department of State. Rafael Kasparov, who is Chief Executive Officer at Orland Synthos Green Energy. Tim Gitzel, Chief Executive Officer of Cameco. John Guidros, Senior Vice President of Terra Praxis. And Isabel Vamecki, who is with Isodope. And I can't see several of my panelists, so if they're making faces at me or disliking my questions, I won't be able to tell. So that's great. Um, <laughs> Under Secretary Jenkins, I would like to start with you. Um, please provide us with a bit of an overview on how the U.S. Department of State is currently engaging with newcomer countries to nuclear energy programs. Great. Oh, excellent. This is working. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, really great to be here. Thank you for inviting me and to be part of this great panel. Um, there's a number of things that state's doing, and I will just um, just touch on uh, a couple things uh, because there's quite a few things that we're doing. And we recognized um, the importance of nuclear energy in terms of addressing issues of climate change. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could do what we could uh, to promote nuclear energy around the world. One of the things we're doing is as we promote things like small modular reactors, we recognized that we needed to find a way to help uh, train and educate and um, do site visits around the world to particular and particular countries who are interested in this. So we started something called the Foundational Infrastructure for Responsible Use of Small Modular Reactor Technology, or FIRST, and which is what it's, we normally use. And uh, it's about $41 million that we have dedicated uh, to do site visits, trainings uh, to countries, new newcomer uh, countries. Uh, we've done. We've trained over 1,750 experts and officials at over 25 countries, where we do training for countries interested in like in small modular reactors. Um, another thing that we have done is called Project Phoenix, and what this is is uh, an effort to help countries convert coal assets to small modular uh, react nuclear reactors that are safe and secure. Um, and so this is something that we uh, launched this year. It was announced last year by Spec Kerry, Secretary Kerry, and we launched this year. Uh, and we had an introduction uh, last month in Bratislava. Um, and we had a number of, uh, of uh, European and Central Asian countries attend that as this new effort to move from coal to small bars reactors. Uh, we also provide over $640 million to the IEA in their uh, peaceful uses uh, work, which is around the world. Uh, and so they're also helping countries in many parts of the world in terms of uh, what they're doing and uh, moving on to uh, nuclear energy. And right now, for example, we have a team in uh, Santiago in Chile that's actually uh, working with 10 countries from Latin America and the Caribbean countries in terms of trainings and introducing them to uh, issues regarding uh, nuclear energy. So we're doing a lot with newcomer countries. Under Secretary Jenkins, thank you so much for that wonderful overview. And I should mention as well that a number of us um, on this panel and in the audience were together in Bratislava just last month um, for the Project Phoenix launch. So in some ways this feels like a mini reunion, but, but in all seriousness it really shows I think the momentum um, of that program to be able to then carry the conversation to now. Um, Raphael, I'd like to turn to you because you, <laughs> you were leading a private sector company that's making and that has made major investments in next generation nuclear technologies in Poland, which is a newcomer country to nuclear. So tell us a little bit about your work. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, how they build a nuclear reactor in this hall? It's really difficult. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yes, we definitely are new guys in the nuclear club. Uh, Poland had, has no experience in nuclear 
uh, Polish regulator has very limited ex experience in, in nuclear and we have to build um, everything from the scratch. So this is very, very difficult task. Uh, but first important thing is that there is a market for SMRs. Um, so it's not that we really fighting to find a place in the energy mix with the commissioning only in Poland of 20 gigawatts of car fire plants um, in the middle of 30s we'll have uh, a gap between energy generation and consumption 14 to 16 gigawatts we're talking about base load only so it will be really difficult to replace this gap with renewables and storage we just need more base load and SMRs they have a unique uh, feature which is a possibility to replace um, source of energy from coal to nuclear doing repowering to the national grid uh, without large investment so we see this opportunity in Poland with repowering of existing fl uh, fleet of coal fire plants uh, it's important for me to say that average coal fire boiler has 300 megawatts so replacing 300 megawatts coal fire SMR with nuclear SMR uh, makes sense from the point of view of the national grid. Um, but it's to make things happen. So we this is what we already know is you cannot follow everything as our big colleagues or West, uh, well established nuclear companies. Uh, so the beginning of our deployment process let's say three years ago we ordered a lot of reports from well established companies how to build nuclear company and I have a shelf full of these reports and one thing I know we cannot repeat it because they spent 50 years to build nuclear company we don't have 50 years and we don't have these billions billions uh, to build new company so we need to go own path a uh, little bit following what for example uh, SpaceX did in, um, in space technology, not repeating what NASA exactly did. Uh, safety, of course, is something what we uh, have to follow without any changes, but the rest uh, we definitely have to go a little bit dif differently. Uh, on the end, I would like to say thank you for the State Department because we are awarded this Phoenix Award. Um, it's not much, <laughs> 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 but um, it's important for us to say thank you very much again, because it's built relation with uh, it's building the relation with um, well-established engineering companies from U.S. So we're going to do feasibility study for removal of coal fire of coal ashes from one of our sites. Just give you an exa example. Uh, we examine one of the sites. Uh, we have six six sites in development. On one side, there is uh, the ashes from the existing coal fire plant which we calculate a cost of removal for 20 million euros just just the ashes and there's also as asbestos so the, such studies are important and i think they will help everybody when we be able to publish this rafael thank you so much and i really appreciate your point that there is a demand there is a market um, for these technologies and i think that that's obviously very true in poland but also true i think all over the world um, Tim, I'd like to go to you because you represent a nuclear fuel company. You're also a part owner of Westinghouse. And so you have tremendous experience with engaging um, in emerging nuclear markets. But tell us a little bit about your work right now. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for, uh, for having us today. Uh, I was really uh, thrilled to be invited, I think, by Sam and others to this panel about new, because there's nothing new about me, I can tell you, or what I do, or our company. I've been, uh, it's been like 40 years that I've been uh, in this industry and, and with the, the nuclear space, and so, are we going in and out? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can hear me okay. So, just just a little bit of background on, on what we do, if you don't know, Cameco, uh, we're headquartered in Saskatchewan, a little cooler than here, I can tell you, we're, we're melting here, but... Uh, so we're, we're in the uranium business. Of course, there is no nuclear without the uranium piece. So we've got uranium beautiful deposits uh, in Canada. We're also in Kazakhstan, United States, Australia with uranium. And then you move to conversion, the next step in the nuclear fuel. We've got some facilities in Ontario. Of course, there's enrichment. 
And then, you know, we, uh, I think Sam said it the other day, I saw her on television before I came here, uh, these are probably the best conditions we've seen for nuclear in the 40 years that I've been in the business uh, right now. I mean, we, we've been for years talking about electrification, decarbonization, race to net zero, climate change, climate crisis, climate catastrophe, all of that stuff. That was all going along giving us tailwinds. And then, of course, uh, we get into energy security issues around the world. And, and you know, the, the, it's becoming a tired uh, slogan to some extent, but, you know, there, there is no net zero that doesn't include nuclear without nuclear. And so we, we, we believe that at, uh, at Cameco. We believe it so much that we took all of the chips we had and put them in the middle of the table and bought Westinghouse with a company called Brookfield, $10 billion, uh, $8 billion U.S., deal because we believe the time is now and and the market is there and we wanted to have the product so when uh, our colleagues uh, around the world are looking for you want existing nuclear we can build you a, an AP1000 we have a SMR we've got a micro reactor uh, called Nivinci and so we're we're, we're going to do that we can provide the f fuel for it including the uranium and the different components and we just said we're all in I, I hope we're right <laughs> I, I think we are. I, I think there's a huge role for nuclear to play in the world uh, right now. And, and, you know, so we're going out to those new emerging markets, talking, uh, we've got our marketing team, uh, we've got a great team that goes out. They're coming to us, quite frankly. Uh, they're coming to us. Uh, we, we, uh, we've never been as busy as we are right now. There's so many countries that have decided to take a look at nuclear. Countries that kind of moved away are back. Even in Canada, where I live, uh, our government in the last... 18 months has done a complete uh, change and we have some of our government people here we're hugely supportive of nuclear and, and new nuclear and supporting our companies and we're, there's a number of us uh, toward new nuclear and it's going to play a, a big role in, in the future replacing coal and, and other generation facilities so the time is now it's a great time and we're uh, delighted to be in the business Chris Levex here there's a lot of new players in the market that are going to bring SMRs to the market so and and we you know at, at we're going to compete uh, fiercely but at the same time we we're all we all have that nuclear we all have to push together the nuclear file because it's not it, we talk a big game right now we have to deliver now and there's a big difference between talking and delivering and and so that's where we are right now I'll stop there for now thanks Tim thank you so much and I really want to highlight what you said about this being the best moment for nuclear in the last 40 years and I think as evidence of that fact, look around at the fact that we are here in the center of the blue zone at COP, at the center at the heart of a climate conference. And so I don't wanna say we've made it because you're right as well that there is still work to be done and we have to do it together. But I do think this is quite a moment for nuclear energy. John, I'd like to turn to you. And I know that we don't read bios here because if we did, we'd be here all day, um, but You've just joined TerraPraxis after 10 years of leading energy industry strategy at Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Tell us about your work and how you're encouraging other companies to view nuclear as an energy source. Yeah, thank you for that, Jennifer, and thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here at such an important event. Um, here's a number, 340 terawatt hours. That's how much global data centers consumed in 2022. To put that in perspective, that's about the combination of Spain and Malaysia put together. And data centers have been growing their consumption at about 20 to 40% per year, depending on who you look at specifically. Um, that's before the adoption of AI that's well underway. So objectively speaking, data led me to this opportunity. And I come at it from two vectors. One is how do we meet those aggressive sustainability targets as John Kerry and many have said, there's no net zero without nuclear. That's one vector. The other is, I've been 20 years at the nexus of energy and technology trying to deliver the energy transition with technology. There's only so much we can do to decarbonize the grid with renewables and technology. We need nuclear. So how do we accelerate that? So I decided that it's time to get in the game and lean in, and that's the work I'm doing. Um, the industry, congratulations to you, has built up a lot of trust and now it's about speed, delivery, and costs. And I'm looking at that as a way to add value by helping, here's an, a paradigm flip for you. The title of this is Engaging Newcomers to Nuclear. I would say I'm looking at it from engaging nuclear as a newcomer. Uh, we need to look at all of industry. We need to look at all of 
uh, the electrified sector, shipping, and ask how do we move faster and deliver safely with high quality. Um, and I think there's new ways of doing business. The last comment I'll make there is I understand that the, the main route to market for nuclear has been with governments and utilities. And I think that uh, I, I can speak confidently that we see new routes to market for nuclear. And uh, we're looking at it very creatively on how we can uh, enable a project development sector and faster adoption, even, a, even at an initial cost premium if necessary. So thank you. John, thank you so much. And I think it really gets back to this point about demand and the fact that there are markets, but we have to talk to these new demand centers um, and really engage effectively. And Isabel, you're working right now to bring nuclear energy to entirely new audiences. And I think you've probably reached people who maybe have never heard of nuclear energy, or if they have, they have no idea what it is and no idea that it's carbon free. So talk to us a little bit about your work and the impact of social media. Yes, yeah, so for those who don't know, um, I call myself a nuclear energy influencer and I create social media content promoting nuclear energy as a solution to climate change, but also energy inequality. And I started this work about three years ago. And I have to say, when I started posting on social media, everybody was like, what is this girl doing? My friends were looking at me like, are you insane? Why are you doing this? Um, at the time, I was a fashion model. My agents were saying, stop doing whatever you're doing. But now in the you know very few years that I've been doing this work, I see a huge shift. I mean, it's night and day, and I think Tim mentioned the fact that you know in 40 years he hasn't seen this. So it's very exciting to me. It's very reassuring that we are all witnessing that momentum. But I do want to say that now is the time to go full speed ahead. You know, we can't just be like we made it and and just let it die down because now is the time to keep pushing from all sides. From from my side is the public communication, and we're talking about welcoming newcomers. We also have to talk about the public newcomers, um, the next generation of workers, because we all know that's a big limiting factor right now to the nuclear industry is the workforce. And I just want to give an example. Yesterday, I gave a, a workshop at a side event here, and I had a group of six high school girls who came to see my talk and they were so excited and at the end we made a little video of them promoting nuclear energy and I'm pretty confident that the government played a role in getting them there and I think that's such a smart strategy right like how can we inspire this next generation of nuclear energy workers um, so I think yeah the, like, like you said the time is now and let's just keep pushing on on all fronts Isabel, thank you so much. And I absolutely agree that as we're talking about next generation technologies, we also have to be talking about the next generation workforce and the next generation of policy leaders as well. So it truly is across the board. Under Secretary Jenkins, I'd like to go back to you. Talk to us a little bit about the challenges that you've experienced in trying to, to engage with newcomer countries, but also the opportunities that you see in both the near and, and long term. Uh, thanks. I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about the challenges, I think we talked a little bit about this already, is um, there are so many opportunities, you know, because there's a, uh, a recognition about the role of, a growing recognition, not only about the role of nuclear energy, but the importance of nuclear energy, because we're not going to get to all of the targets that we want without the use of nuclear energy, as you heard. So I think countries are starting to recognize that, you know, in my travels, when I meet with countries bilaterally, um, you know, from around the world, there's a strong interest in countries figuring out how nuclear energy could be part of their energy mix. Um, and the challenge, of course, that we've talked about is this strong interest and how do we actually meet the interest because some countries don't have the infrastructure yet, uh, they don't have the trained individuals yet. So part of the first program I talked about was to try to do that, working with our Nuclear Regulatory Commission to help countries with regulations. Um, you know, so it's a whole of government approach that we're doing and, on, you know, and also bringing in uh, academia and industry as well as you're hearing here to do this. But that's the challenge is how do you, and you've heard it, how do you meet the interest? But it's, so it's a great opportunity, but it's also a great challenge. And also one last thing is that um, as we do this, we're also trying to make sure that countries are doing this uh, thinking in terms of safety, security, and nonproliferation. And so we also have to push that as we put the message, push the message of the importance of nuclear technology and nuclear energy, but we have to do it so that it's safe, secure, 
and non-proliferation and proliferation resistant. And that's where working with closely with the IAEA is important. So we have to keep track of a lot of things. It's not just pushing nuclear energy. We have to make sure we do it in a very responsible way as well. Under Secretary, thank you so much. Um, and I, again, want to pick up on the point that you made about needing a whole of government approach, which I think is absolutely crucial, um, especially you know if the United States is to compete against state-owned enterprises. Um, and the second point that you made is how interdisciplinary this field is. And I think truly it requires all of us. And I think that if we polled even just this audience, everybody might have a different degree um, from school. And it, and it doesn't matter. We need everybody together um, working on these issues. Raphael, I want to turn to you uh, because I know you've thought a lot and you're working a lot in, in, in the field of financing nuclear. What do you assess as some of the challenges and opportunities um, in nuclear finance? Okay. Now we talk about money. Yes. <coughs> so, uh, how much you said? 340 terawatts hour. Correct. Okay. <coughs> so, let's say that it will require to build 120 SMRs in the size of 300 megawatts. It gives us, let's say, what? 300 billion US dollars, 400 billion <coughs> if you don't include uh, supply chain and benefits we can have from uh, decrease of prices with the very large supply chain. So uh, is, it, is it a lot, 100 SMRs? Uh, so if you think about this um, 340 terabyte hours you need in base load probably, uh, because you will not be dependent on renewables. So to build uh, offshore wind uh, towers, you will have to, s to spend about two, two trillion, because it's seven times more, more or less. Just simple calculation, steel and concrete has a price, and it's a price for megawatt hour. And if you think about building 15 megawatts uh, turbine, which gives you more or less uh, energy, electrons to the grid only 30, 40% of time, I'm talking about the offshore, uh, it's only 15 megawatts, comparing to 300 megawatts uh, SMR you need, which number of steel used for the one tower is similar for the reactor pressure vessel and all nuclear, uh, nuclear islands. So um, the numbers are definitely on the um, new nuclear side, I would say. Uh, and I think that uh, to finance a fleet of reactors, of SMRs, not just one somewhere in the second, in other place, we need to do a lot of more meetings like these with people for finance to get with these numbers to the head of um, to the minds of, uh, of finance people. But uh, frankly speaking, I don't think we'll have a big problem from to finance uh, even the fleet approach because uh, what is important from for, for on the end, from the state point of view, for example, uh, Central European states which are not very rich, um, is the cost for the end customer uh, and it's a cost when it has to include uh, backup for renewables, it has to include rebuilding national grid, and when you add all and storages in case of uh, renewables, and so when you calculate all these costs together and compare with the SMRs, uh, you definitely have a much bigger number than uh, SMRs providing baseload energy 24 hours a day and not additional cost for the backup or for the um, rebuilding national grid. So numbers are on our side. We just, this what we need is, uh, is to, to talk more with people from finance, especially from countries like Canada or UK, where it's a lot of experience with financing nuclear. Uh, EDC just financed Darlington with 800 million Canadian dollars and they should lead a role uh, in financing and sharing this experience with other countries. And on the end, I would like to say that we spent already over $100 million just to site uh, evaluation, engineering, uh, standard design financing, and other. And we know that the money flow very fast from such projects. So this, how we, what we need to do is one thing more, is this private company view on nuclear. Private, private view, how to spend the money rational way, how to not things, how not, not to do things we don't need uh, on, on, on this time uh, in nuclear. Rafael, thank you so much um, for those insights into nuclear finance. And you brought up the supply chain issue, which I'd like to stick with. So, Tim, 
you're working with countries that are either looking to build new nuclear or looking to add to their existing reactor fleets. So to what extent are you talking with these countries about the reliability of the global nuclear supply chain? Are there any areas of concern? And what are industry and governments doing to close those gaps? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have to say, sitting between these two gentlemen especially, I get a bit choked up when I translate how much uh, electricity they're going to produce into uranium. I think, oh, I wonder who. That sounds like a good deal for us. So. Anyway, it, it, and I say that in some jest, but I can tell you if I went back 2011 to 2020, 2021, it wasn't a party for us, I can tell you. We shut down mines, we shut down facilities, we put people out of work, thousands of them, because the market fell away from us. And that was no fun, and I don't suggest you ever try that. So now it's coming back again. We're going to be very cautious. Is there enough fuel for, to fuel? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Let me be clear about that. You can look in the IAEA red book and you'll see the resources. Question is at what price is, is, is it available? You see the price moving uh, and, and so, you know, as that comes on and as we as a company get secure contracts, we'll bring on more production. We can do that. We've got more to bring on. I can tell you Kazakhstan, Australia, US, a lot of countries. There's The material is there. That's on the uranium side. You can't make uranium with government policy. You can't make it. It's in the ground or it's not, period. But the, the other components of the fuel cycle, conversion, enrichment, those are services. You can build those. You can build those. And you see companies that have them now starting to expand them because the market's there. And we were all, we all got burnt pretty bad to, in the 2010s. But now that's coming around. We'll build new facilities. Governments have been super supportive. Somebody mentioned the Canadian government put $800 million, uh, I think, uh, through the Canada Infrastructure Bank into one of the the, uh, the electricians uh, in Canada. So there's a real effort going on. We're talking, I know, but in North America, between Canada and the US on how we can build out the nuclear fuel supply chain so that we can have enough uh, material uh, to, to, to fuel. The other thing is you don't sneak reactors on. They don't come on like next week and say, oh, we didn't know that one was coming. We usually have about five to 10 years notice that they're coming on, which gives us time to adjust and, and adapt and as I say as we have certainty that there's contracts there for us to to put the fuel into then we'll bring that on we're not going to do it on speculation we tried that didn't work so good and we're still nervous about Russia to be clear uh, Russia supplied 30 to 40 percent of the entire market pick what you'll it's a little less uranium a little more conversion a lot of enrichment and so right now they're kind of taboo they're a bit off but if they're coming back, all of a sudden, if that gets resolved, hopefully it does very soon. But when it, if everybody goes back there, then we're left to, you know, building new facilities that are. So we're taking a cautious approach to it. Bottom line is the fuel is there. It will be there for the new build. Tim, thank you so much. And I really appreciate that historical perspective. And I think understanding where the industry has been and then, of course, comparing that with where it is now. Um, John, I know you've looked a lot at policy issues in the United States. Now you're part of an international company looking, I think, at, at global policies. Um, what are some of the policy challenges that you see and what, what would you say is at the top of your policy wish list? Um, that's a big question. Um, let me pick up first on this idea that there's, a, there's really two industries here within nuclear, right? There's the well-established operating industry that has done a lot of research and development and is in, in deployment mode, operation mode, or maybe even sometimes decommissioning mode. Well established. Then we have advanced nuclear that's doing a great job at R&D and moving into deployment. So I look at the policy heavily on the side of how do we move advanced into deployment, advanced nuclear into deployment. And we need to do that safely. So first of all, let's mainstream nuclear, make sure it's part of the clean energy definition. And I think we've made great strides this week in that. So hats off to net zero nuclear for helping to make that happen, 22 countries. Um, in addition, looking at deployment, what can we do to mainstream, not mainstream, excuse me, streamline licensing, process, uh, licensing, permitting, and permissions. There are um, really great analogs across renewable energy deployment where we know where the bottlenecks come in around uncertainty and cost. What can we do to streamline that? Currently, the licensing is pretty manual from my sort of review. I mean, I think New Scale's licensing in the United States was over 2 million pages, largely manually prepared, manually reviewed at an hourly rate. 
as a technologist, I look at that as a huge opportunity to add some value and help streamline that. But in the policy itself, what are the licensing pathways that really look to SMRs, micro reactors, and maybe this new category of minis that can really achieve economies of scale, mass manufacturing, and that will help with the $2 trillion figure you just presented. And don't worry, Tim, they all need fuel, so you're good either way. But um, I think that, you know, Financing, supply chain, deployment, and certainty to bring down costs and, de and ensure delivery timelines are where we're focused. Two trillion was the cost for the renewables for offshore. For SMRs, the same number, you can calculate 300, 300 or 400 billion, 100 units, yes. Much less, but still a lot of opportunity. I like that. John, thank you so much. Um, and I think I, I saw a lot of the industry heads in the audience nodding when we talked about deployment. Um, so appreciate that as well. Um, Isabel, the last time that you and I spoke, we talked about the gummy bear videos. And um, you made a point about needing to communicate with people in terms that they understand. So for those of you, for those in the audience who might not be familiar with the gummy bear videos, um, tell us a little bit about them. And why, why is talking about them, why, why is talking about gummy bears and this analogy, why is that so crucial? Yes, for, for those who don't know, I, I made a video, it was probably one of my most popular videos, where I talk about how one uranium pellet, roughly the size of a gummy bear, has as much energy as 149 gallons of oil, 2,000 pounds of coal, or 12,000 Big Macs. Um, actually, Nick Turan from <laughs> Terrafar helped me make that calculation. But... You know, it might sound like something silly, but in reality, w the case that I was making was because of that, you know, we can create a lot of energy in small spaces, which leaves a lot of room for nature. And I think it's always important to remind ourselves why we're communicating about nuclear energy to the general public. Why should they care? Um, and so always bringing it in terms that they can understand, but also telling the, the personal benefit they have um, if they, you know, accept or start promoting this this technology and I want to say that one insight I've gained on this trip is that the concerns about nuclear have changed they used to be around safety and waste and all of those things that we all heard a billion times but now the new generation they kind of don't think about those things too much their concerns are jobs and uranium mining funnily enough um, it's become a huge topic in, in the younger generations and I think that uh, trying to address those questions and then also show them, the, again, the benefits of nuclear in that space, I think are going to be very important. And we're all here talking about the quota nuclear transition. I've been making this case the past few events I've done, and it really resonates with the younger audiences. When you tell them that you can retrain the workforce at a coal plant to now work at a nuclear power plant with better jobs, um, with better health outcomes, because they're not inhaling you know, coal fumes, so I think bringing those points is going to be very, very important in this next generation of public communication about nuclear energy. Isabel, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we are drawing near to the end um, of, of time for this panel. But I very quickly would like to ask each of you to talk a little bit briefly about the significance of just the fact that we're here at the heart of COP28 having these conversations about nuclear. I think maybe safe to say accepted or at least at the center of the climate community. Um, we just saw the pledge to triple nuclear by 2050 and just some other, I think, really amazing milestones and announcements. So talk to us, just share your thoughts on the fact that we're here, Under Secretary. Um, I actually find it exciting. I mean, we've talked about the change that we've seen in such a short time frame. Um, and I think it reflects the fact that people feel more confident in nuclear uh, energy, uh, which has changed, like I said, a lot. Um, and so people are really looking at it as a real alternative. And we're hearing this from the new nuclear co newcomers who are saying, I want to look at nuclear energy as part of my energy mix. And so I think that is what's giving so, so much rise to this excitement. And, and as you said, the fact that it's such a prominent issue at COP28, I mean, that says a lot. You know, like you said, the, the, the recent uh, Saturday announcement on, on tripling nuclear energy by 2050 is just a, a, just a beginning or part of a, 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 a renaissance on this issue. Um, so I think it's really exciting, and I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of 
um, all the things we're doing, working with, working with governments around the world, working with industries around the world, academia around the world, working with the next generation of, of young people as we're all talking here today. It's a, it's a really exciting time, and so we just got to make the most of it. Undersecretary, thank you so much. Raphael. Um, so uh, I'm being late here, um, my apology. But actually, I was on time at 11, perfectly. But you know, for nuclear, be on time and on budget, it's not enough. You need to be before, uh, before everybody. So we still have some space to improve, but cooperation, harmonization, cooperation between regulators, uh, what exactly right now in the case of BWX 300, that's a fact we have joint assessment between CNSC, NSC, and Polish regulator. Second, um, <coughs> This what Isabel you doing is, is is extremely important for for us because it's it's really difficult to find a good audience for the numbers when you're sharing just numbers examples, metaphors. That's a way exactly to build this narration about the this opportunity and about the uh, mining uranium. Uh, shares of Cameco increase uh, double or triple triple during last five times. So enough cash to build new mines on time and uh, and help these your future clients to build uh, uh, a fleet of SMOs. Raphael, thank you. Tim, thoughts on being here at, at COP28? I, I just say I am so delighted to be on this panel. And let me give you an example and then I'll tell you, tell you why. So I said I've been doing this for decades, like four decades. Uh, how long have you been doing this? Like three years? She has about 10 million followers. I have less than eight, I think. <laughs> so you can see how the world has changed. So, you can see how the world has changed. Look at this panel. I can tell you, I've been doing this for a long time, come, been on these panels for decades. It was usually four guys that looked about exactly like me. Come out of the submarine business and, and went into nuclear, ran the whole thing. Honestly, that's what it was. And, and we're never gonna win looking like that. And so now to see Isabel and, and you know the undersecretary and, and others, young people, it, it is just warms my heart that we have a future in this business and we need to communicate and you know, they listen to, you know, I, I send out a fax and nobody really responds to it. She sends out a whatever and there's two million people follow it. So I think we've got hope for, the, for, this, for this industry and, and we need to keep uh, diversifying and, and including people in our journey going forward. Tim, really appreciate that. And I, I'm also seeing some Navy nuke heads nodding in the, in the audience along with you. John, <laughs> John, uh, your thoughts? I'll just add, um, hold, hold on to your hats. And, and what I mean is now that nuclear is being adopted into the agenda, I mean, COP has always been about paradigm shift. And here we are moving into true paradigm shift territory. Um, we used to have a saying at Amazon on my team that innovation is two parts, right? It's ideas and execution, absent execution, it's, it's a dream. And the demand is there, that's very clear, and we're gonna need to execute, and it's an all hands on deck thing to meet this paradigm shift. We can't think inc incrementally, we've gotta work together. John, thank you. And Isabel? I mean, this is my first COP, so I don't have a reference, but um, I've heard from many, many people that obviously this it's unprecedented, the support for nuclear energy, which is really exciting. As I said before, I also notice a huge difference in public acceptance. And I don't want to scare everybody here, but I do want to say something. I've heard that there were a couple of nuclear renaissances in the past that we all know did not pan out. And I think we're living through or getting into a nuclear renaissance right now. And now is the time for the industry to deliver. Because I'm afraid, and again, not to scare you, if this doesn't work, I don't know if nuclear energy will be given another chance. So please take that as you will and just put all your energy into actually building on time, on budget, delivering and creating this future that we all want to live in. Thank you. Isabel, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both for the, the, word, of, the, the word of caution or warning, um, but also I think the call to action. And I just want to take a moment and thank our panelists, not just for their incredible insights and remarks on this panel, but also for the work that each and every one of them is doing. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you all soon.
Yes.